Yeah, it works. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Michael, and today I'm going to talk about uh, the Kitchma framework. Uh, it's a micro framework built on top of Reagent, and this talk is going to be both about the framework and how we use it to, to build the apps. Um, before I start about Kitchma, uh, I just want to say a few words about me. Uh, I have around 15 years of software development experience, and for the last seven years, I've been working mainly as a front-end developer. Um, and Kitchma is the second framework I've been working on. Previously, I was working as a consultant and a co core contributor uh, for the KenJS framework, which is not uh, very popular, but it was one of the first frameworks on the market. I started using it somewhere around uh, 2009, and then I started working as a core contributor. And I built a lot of apps in that time uh, based on KenJS, uh, mainly in enterprise environments. So I've seen a lot of problems that had to be solved both on the application and on the framework level. And Kitchma is uh, my way, my solution to these problems. And as I said, there was a lot of them, especially in the enterprise environments. Um, so when I started working on Kitchma, I set some goals that I wanted uh, for Kitchma to, to ensure and uh, enable. And these are the three that are relevant to this uh, talk. So first of all, uh, I wanted your applications to be deterministic and predictable. Uh, in Kitchma's, uh, for Kitchma, that means that based on your URL and your route, you can uh, easily determine what is going to be the, uh, the content of your application state. Um, I also wanted to ensure uh, unidirectional data flow in a very strict manner. Uh, I wanted to avoid a situation where a component would be mounted and then uh, require some data from the server, which is a pattern that's, that's uh, pretty often seen in React apps. And I wanted to enable your apps to have enforced lifecycle and memory safety, which is something that's not maybe so important today as it was like five years ago when i6 was the main browser and when we had to be very careful with, with any memory leaks. And it's with React, it's much harder to make uh, memory leaks anyway, but I will show you some examples of this. Um, so Kitchma uh, is a bit different than the other frameworks. And if you ask me what is the secret sauce of Kitchma, how it's different, I would say that it's the way how the router works with the rest of the framework. Uh, so it's built in, uh, can change it. And unlike other approaches, um, the router only converts data from two formats, from the URL to data and vice versa. So you give it a URL, you get back a map of data, and you get, give it a map of data and get back the URL. Uh, route data is also stored in the AppDB, so you treat it like any other uh, part of your application state. And the router is the main driver of change. Uh, I will explain this in detail later, but in Kitchma, router is the one uh, that's causing everything to happen. Uh, before I continue with the um, with, uh, architecture, I want to just show you quickly uh, the API of the router. So the router implements uh, two main functions as its API. It's map to URL and URL to map. And uh, as you can see, you can define some patterns that will be used to serialize and deserialize the route. And when you give it the map, it will get back the string. Anything, any key that was not found in a route pattern will be serialized uh, as a query param, which is something that we very often use uh, to, fill, to store some things like uh, filter params or, or paging params, stuff like that. So yeah, that's, that's how the, the router works. Uh, if we look at the architecture of a Kitch map, the router is the one sitting on the top. Uh, and on every route change, every time the URL changes, it will uh, invoke the controller manager. Uh, this is the part of Kitchma that's not that you don't inter uh, interact with directly. It's not exposed publicly, but it's the one that takes care uh, of all the application uh, state changes and stuff like that. So Kitchma has some uh, concept called controllers. They are a place where you put your uh, state mutation code, uh, calls to HTTP, business domain code. They're they are the place where your uh, business domain connects with the Kitchma as a framework. And as you can see, uh, all the arrows point down. So that's the, the part that I talked about, the unidirectional data flow. 
So the router invokes the controller manager, and then controllers grab the data from the server and put it into application state, which gets rendered on the UI. And this yellow arrow, um, that's just uh, events or commands going from the UI to controllers. So controllers have these uh, two, two things that they take care about, uh, reacting to route changes and reacting to user uh, interactions. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about the part that's bordered in the, in the yellow box, so we're not going to cover anything about the application state or the UI. But if you used uh, any other reagent-based framework, uh, it's pretty similar. OK, so uh, controllers. Um, they are implemented as closure records, and you have a bunch of uh, multi-methods defined on them that implement uh, the behavior. So you can um, override the behavior that you want. And these are the four uh, most important functions uh, that provide uh, the behavior of controllers and uh, give you the magic that Kichma gives you. So first of all, there is uh, the params function. This function will be called by the controller manager on every route change. And what this function does, uh, it receives the data containing the route and, receives, uh, and returns a value, or nil. And based on that, the controller manager will, be, will determine if this controller should be running or not. So we'll have a bunch of controllers uh, running at a time in an, in an app, but you don't want them to run at the same time, because you have, if you're on a user account page, you don't need an uh, articles controller or vice versa. Uh, if that function returns a non-nil value, start function will be called. Uh, here you can mutate the application state if you want. Uh, it's a synchronous call. So all the controllers will, uh, will be called uh, in one synchronous call and muted the state. And if the controller was started, the handle function will be, will be called, uh, which is where you put your sync code. And I will cover that uh, in detail later. And another important function here is the stop function. Uh, this function is called when the controller is stopped. Uh, so when you want to clean up after that controller, you would put that code in the stop function. Um, so in, for example, this is how it would look. Uh, if we had a controller that would uh, be active only with the page params present in the route, uh, this is a table that, would be, that uh, shows how the decisions uh, would be made in the controller manager layer. So if this controller, if this uh, params function returns nil and then nil again, uh, controller will be stopped. If it goes from nil to a value, articles, articles in this case, uh, the controller manager will start the controller and put it in the started state. Uh, if you go from articles to blog, so if the value changes, it will stop the old instance and start the new instance. And if you go from articles to nil, it will stop the controller. And finally, if the value is the same as the previous one, uh, the controller will be left alone. So this is uh, when I said that route is the main driver of change, this is uh, what I meant. So you will use your controllers to react uh, on route changes and to ensure they are active only when they are needed. Uh, why controllers? Why, why this concept? Uh, so I wanted a way to automatically run code when you enter or exit the route. Uh, based on the route, you can always know what kind of data you need for, to render that page. So this was a good way. Uh, to implement that. Uh, it also allowed me to enforce the lifecycle to give you hooks when you need to release uh, some resources. So you can uh, release data that you don't need anymore. You can release event handlers. You can disconnect from web sockets. Uh, you, can, you can model this kind of behavior easily with, with this API. Uh, there are also a place to put your dirty code. Uh, I mean, by, what I mean by that is uh, all the code that has some side effects mutations uh, that connects to the server goes to controllers. And controllers are, bu are built in a very non-opinionated non way. Uh, they get full access to application state, not only to the value, but to the whole atom. So you can uh, mutate the state whenever and however you want. And because of that, you can use whatever pattern you want uh, to implement your app. You don't have to. Uh, build your apps in, in the Kichma way. They just give you a portal between your domain code and, and Kichma. Just uh, to recap this part, when the user clicks on a link, uh, URL will change, controller manager will receive the new uh, route data. It will do something with the controllers, maybe start them, maybe stop them. They can react to this and load the data, clean up the data, and finally, um, the changes will be propagated to the UI so in the same manner like in the other frameworks. 
So I mentioned the controller handler uh, function before. Uh, I want to show you in detail what you can do with it. Uh, as I said, it's a place for the async fun functionality. You get the full access to the application DB. You can uh, mutate the application DB in any way you want. You don't have to use events or anything. And you communicate with the other controllers and the rest of the app to, to channels. Uh, each controller receives two channels, one for sending messages to other controllers and one to receive messages from uh, controller manager, UI layer, and other controllers. So based on that, you can uh, use message passing to, to build any kind of feature you want. Uh, here is the, the simplest implementation uh, for controller handl handler. Makes an AJAX request. Uh, when the result comes back, it just puts the, the data in, in the application state. Uh, nothing too smart here. But as you can see, we are using swap here directly. Uh, if you want to implement uh, this feature and add another uh, feature, let's say we want to load articles and then allow the user to also upload the article, uh, we have to do a, have a bit more complex code. In this case, uh, we use the start method uh, to execute the load articles command. What this will do, it will just put the message on an in-chain, on controller's in-chain, so you can grab that message from the, the go loop, react to the event, and then wait for another uh, command. A uh, nice thing about using channels uh, in the controller layer is that Kichma will automatically close all the channels when the controller stops. So even if you have some uh, things that come after the controller is stopped, uh, they will not be, uh, you will not get that message and you will not have weird bugs uh, related to timing. And so yeah, we have load article command here, which is passed from, uh, the start function and upload article, which would probably come from the UI in this case. Uh, here is a bit more complex uh, function. So this is from an application that has an uh, order history page. And it can receive uh, update to the data through the WebSockets. So what it does here is it connects to a WebSocket when the, uh, when the page is loaded. So we only, this controller will only run when we are on the order history page. Uh, we will load the order history. Uh, we will connect to the socket I.O. And this function will uh, receive in chain as an argument. And it will just put uh, socket I.O. Uh, events uh, back on the in chain. And then we can react to that and update the application state. Nice thing about this is that you can disconnect from a web socket uh, when you don't need this controller anymore. Sorry. So when you move from the order history page, the stop function will be called, and it will execute the disconnect function, which will ensure that uh, you disconnect from the web socket, you release any event handlers, and you keep the state clean. This is a really, really nice example of uh, how controllers allow you to uh, keep your application memory safe. Uh, so when we started to use them, uh, the API was the biggest problem, not the features that uh, it allowed. We like the power, but there was always a lot of boilerplate code uh, included when you have to use a go loop and work with channels. Even for the simplest uh, features, it's not that fun. Uh, we would always clump together all these state mutations and, and the sync calls in one function because it was simpler to do. And in, in time, it, would, it became hard to figure out what's going on. Uh, another observation we had is that a lot of actions on front end have uh, the same structure. Uh, for instance, if you want to load uh, an item from the, from the back end, first thing that you want to do probably is mark that item as loading, so you can show the spinner on the UI, then make an uh, AJAX call, uh, wait for the data to come in, and then replace the data in the application state. So you have these things happening in succession. And we wanted a solution that, uh, that could allow us to implement these kind of features in a nicer way. Uh, so we introduced pipelines. They are built on top of the controllers. They are not part of the core. They are completely optional to use. But they have a very nice application, uh, nice abstraction, abstraction over this kind of uh, task-based uh, features that have a list of steps. And what is very nice about them is that uh, it's very easy to understand what's going on. You have a list of things that happen uh, without any event ping pong uh, going on. So the code is easy to follow. And they can handle promises. So uh, in a native way, and they, both, they can also uh, handle errors that happen in the pipeline. Uh, this was inspired by the talk, I think it was Railroad, driven design or something like that, 
which implements a similar uh, pattern in F sharp. So here is uh, an example. This would be called from the controller layer. So if you want to load in a restaurant, uh, this is like a list of the steps uh, that I mentioned before. First, we will mark the restaurant as loading. Then we get the restaurant, uh, which is an IJX request. We call a pure function that will unpack that re request uh, return value. And then we store the data back uh, inside the application state. One thing that's uh, important to notice here, side effects are uh, clearly marked. They, they have this, uh, for instance, here, commit uh, exclamation. That's a side effect. And when they, uh, when they are in the pipeline, they are not able to affect the value. The value can only be affected by return, uh, return values from the normal functions. So you can have these side effects that can mutate the state but cannot affect the value. Or you can have functions that affect the value but cannot have uh, side effects. It's a nice way uh, to split these kind of features. Uh, the way it works, uh, it's a macro that basically unpacks the whole pipeline, uh, wraps every block in a function, and then calls it, uh, checks if the return value is side effect, checks if, if the return value is promise, and you get that kind of behavior uh, where it's very understandable what's going on, but you don't have to, to care about uh, a lot of stuff. Here's another example. Uh, so the feature that we implement here is a notification that disappears after five seconds. And I like this example very much because it shows how simple it is uh, to build this kind of features in, with pipelines. So first thing we do, we add notice to, to the application state. Then we delay pipeline for five seconds, and then we remove it. Uh, this delay pipeline is just a function that returns a promise that's uh, resolved after five seconds, or whatever you put in the argument. So you can kind of combine uh, these little blocks in, in bigger uh, features. Uh, another example, uh, live search example, or type ahead. I'm sure that uh, if you implemented this feature manually, uh, you know there are a lot of race conditions here. So what you do is uh, you let user to type in some data, and you make a request when there is no uh, keystroke for some time, 300 milliseconds here. But if you made a request and then a new keystroke comes in, you want to cancel the old request because you might have race condition, get the wrong data, and stuff like that. There, is, there are some uh, race condition and corner cases that have to be taken care of uh, for this feature. It's very easy to implement uh, with pipelines. We use the exclusive helper here. Uh, as I mentioned, pipelines uh, can handle promises, but they also return promises. So exclusive helper here keeps track of the last promise returned from the pipeline. And if a new request comes uh, before the promise is resolved, it will throw away its result and just start a new promise. So it, you can implement this kind of complex behavior very, very easily. So we check if there is a value, if the user uh, entered something. We wait for 300 milliseconds. We make an AJAX call. And then we do something with the results. And if something happened between uh, while the request is happening, if there is a new keystroke, uh, we would start a new pipeline, and the old one would be thrown away. Uh, yeah, so pipelines were great, uh, but they didn't solve all the problems we had. Uh, we had still some problems related to data loading, especially in the more complex applications where you might have uh, dependencies between the data. So you need one part of data to be resolved before you can request another one. And the way we started to fix that was by implementing something I call GLAD controllers, where we just lump all the requests in one place and order them manually and uh, pray for the best. But the problem that we encountered then on one of the apps that we built was uh, when user was logging in, we had to reload a bunch of application state, like 50% of it. And it was kind of not nice to handle this tectonic change because we had to reload a lot of data. So we would have another GUT controller, uh, this time for the user. And we wanted to solve this in a way, uh, and we had some ideas. One of them was uh, command broadcasting for controllers, which wouldn't be hard to implement, but it would make, uh, make controllers dependent on one another. And the other idea was to enable one controller to wait on the result from another controller, but that also creates dependencies. We wanted to avoid that, because controllers are the best when they are completely isolated uh, between themselves. And here is another library that we built. 
on top of Kitchma control, control layer. Uh, it's also optional. It's also not part of the core. But it gives you features that are uh, present in some other frameworks like Relay, where, but where you have to go all in. Like you have to use GraphQL always and stuff like that. And it gives you in a very nice and declarative way. Uh, it can resolve graph data sources. And the way it works is very similar to controllers. Uh, it will use route uh, to determine what needs to be loaded and what needs to be invalidated. And I will just show it here uh, really quickly. So you can define the data sources in your app. Uh, they can depend on one another. And then uh, data loader will know how to resolve it. So I'm kind of uh, out of time. Just be quick here. Uh, data loader, I could talk about it for like a whole talk, but uh, this was about the controller layer. Uh, it works great with GraphQL. If you're interested with that, uh, I will post this, uh, these slides online so you can check it. Uh, it allows you to combine all the requests happening at the same time to one request. Uh, and that kind of optimization is uh, available on library level. level. Um, in conclusion, uh, the main message I want, want to give you today was uh, that treating route as the ma uh, minimal representation of state is a really great, great way uh, to ma make your application more deterministic and to give you life cycles and to give you memory safety and declarative data loading. Uh, we model our, all our apps in that way, and we didn't yet find uh, a case where it was not a great solution. So yeah, that's all for me, and thank you for listening. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Mihal. So, any questions?